Thank you very much. Uh, well, first and foremost, I want to say thanks to uh, Blogs with Balls and uh, with, uh, for Google uh, for uh, hosting this and also certainly to GQ. Uh, I did uh, embellish the story a little bit and told my kids and my wife that I was going to be in GQ. Uh, because of this, yeah, exactly, it was the same laughter. Um, uh, but thank you, thank you for my self-esteem. Um, uh, but, you know, look, it is a great opportunity to be here, and certainly, you know, we're here to talk about the things that interest the players of the National Football League, but obviously, the real reason that we're here is all of you here love at least the players of the National Football League or love the game. Uh, and we're brought here today in this uh, week and in this town because something called the draft. And it is a, a tremendous opportunity, certain for fans of the game and certainly for people uh, who are about to transition from college into the pros. But, you know, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is probably something you won't hear tonight on uh, NFL uh, Network or also on ESPN. Uh, I kind of doubt that tonight during the draft, although there will be plenty of time for it, that there will be few discussions about moral philosophy or the duties from employers to employees or the postulates of medical ethics. My guess is those things won't come up from Rich Eisen tonight. You never know, uh, but it just might. But today is uh, at least an opportunity where I hope at the end of the talk, um, we can exchange some sort of really cool dialogue about those issues because those are the issues that really concern uh, the leadership, the player leadership, and the staff of the union that I love, the, the NFL Players Association. So by way of backdrop, most of you uh, know a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I come from a long line of Baptist preachers. Uh, I am the one who did not go into the ministry, so you can draw your own conclusions uh, about that. My, my dad certainly does. Uh, but uh, uh, I also grew up a Redskin fan, Washington, D.C. And uh, I was one of those uh, folks, certainly before this job, that lived and died over uh, my guys in Burgundy and Gold. And I know that Guys like RG3 and, and Santana Moss and London Fletcher are the Redskins of today that everybody uh, loves. But when I was growing up, it was guys named Sonny Jurgensen and Billy Kilmer, Charlie Taylor. For those uh, of you in the room who are younger than 30, none of these people sound familiar to you, of course. Uh, but for the older people in the, in the crowd, Carl, uh, Mr. Cosell, guys like Pat Fisher, and uh, Larry Brown were guys that I just loved and adored. And it was an interesting time because just like um, fans of that age, the only access that we had with those players was what? On Sunday morning, you know, you'd get that CBS, you know, we are here live at RFK Stadium. You'd get that wonderful introduction. And really our only interaction with those players were we could turn the TV on and I could see them. But unlike today, uh, once we turn the TV off, those players in, in some weird way kind of just dematerialized. They were gone. Uh, they were, had helmets on. You might see them after the game. You might see a brief interview after the game. But unlike the Google generation, or as uh, I like to torture my kids with, the Google machine, um, yeah, they, again, they laugh at me uh, all the time, we had no ability to instantly search see, hear, or interact with the players that we loved at any time, much less after Sunday. So what does it mean today, fast forward, and, and as I am on the cusp of turning 50, um, my daughter continues to remind me that I'm old, uh, what does it mean today when you and I can instantly search and come in contact with the players not only that we continue to watch today, but the players that we used to watch back then. The fact that you've got something like School of the Legends that can give you as a fan a complete interaction or discourse with a current or former player. The fact that I could find out through Twitter, again, the Twitter machine as I like to call it, I, I can find out what Drew Brees has to say about X, Y, and Z. Um, I don't really know what Instagram is, but I know that that's something else that's electronic and special. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know and I, I don't quite understand what it means now that the players that we grew up loving and watching today, we have more information than we ever have about them. We can see them and interact with them, at least virtually, in a way that you could never do. And, and as you, you continue sort of through that philosophical construct, 
what does it mean when the people that were two-dimensional on a television set on Sunday suddenly become three-dimensional and in a way that we can constantly interact today? So you know that the National uh, uh, Football League Players Association, we've done things in, in the um, realm of health and safety that uh, I'm quite proud of. Um, and we do those things because we know that we have an obligation to the members who played this game, will play this game, uh, and the people who are playing it now. But again, the next step is, is what? We may know more about what our players go through. We may know more about what pain and injuries are. We certainly know more about traumatic brain injury. We know more about the importance of decreasing contact in practices as we did when we eliminated two-a-day practices. We know more about how concussions relate to youth sports. But I would argue that while we know more, we are unable or incapable of engendering or facilitating change until we are willing to act on the information that we know. It is not until that we take the information that we know and we either will ourselves or compel ourselves or compel other people to act on the information that we know that you can ever and we can ever affect change. So unlike probably most of the conversation uh, later on tonight, just for a few minutes, uh, minutes I want to talk about something called empathy. Not sympathy, empathy. Because it is not until you take the information that you know and you will yourself to take a look at the new perspective based upon the information that you know that you are willing to take a step to affect change. So by way of, uh, I believe that we've sometimes lost our art of storytelling. So just for a minute as we conclude, um, I, I want to tell you why we teach the players of the National Football League the story about a fire that took place in Greenwich Village uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, March 25th of 1911, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory building stood uh, in Greenwich Village. The top uh, uh, eighth, ninth, and tenth floor housed most of the garment workers of the time who were primarily what? Women, very good, women, who worked at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. They worked under conditions where they did whatever they could to crowd uh, as many of those people inside that building as possible because the employer obviously knew that the more people that you could cram in those close quarters, the longer you could get them to work, the higher their what would be? Profits. So the, on that evening uh, at about 4 o'clock, a fire uh, broke loose in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory plant um, at about 4.40 p.m. By 5 o'clock p.m., both of the top floors of that building were in full um, distress. Uh, the people that you see here that were taken in the picture before the fire um, had nowhere to go because the entrances had been blocked, the fire escapes had been blocked, uh, there was no fire sprinkler security um, system. There had been no plans whatsoever for mass evacuation. And really in the course of about 15 minutes, 143 primarily women and children died in that fire from either smoke inhalation, being burned to death, and, and some jumped to their death in order to flee. So why do we teach the story about a shirt factory fire that took place over a hundred years ago. We do so because what most people don't remember, if they remember anything about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, is a year before that fire, again, the union for those workers, again, a union primarily made up of women, got together to talk about the disparity in wages between the one or two men you see working there and the number of women who are working there, so that there was a wide disparity in the way they were paid, but they also were concerned about child labor laws because the youngest victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire were 14 years old. Two girls who were 14 years old. So that union got together to talk about all of those 
conditions. They did go on strike. They won some con uh, sorry concessions when it came to the disparity of wages and the work hours, but they really didn't win any concessions at all about the unsafe working conditions. After that fire took place, uh, the women's uh, uh, garment union uh, bonded together because they took what everybody would consider to be a horrible tragedy that ended up with coffins lining the streets as people came by to identify their loved ones and turned it into a rallying cry not only for better and safer working conditions, but they were able to convince the primarily all, let's be blunt, white male political establishment to make changes in less than, less than a year. The reason we teach that story is, again, think about it just for a second. It's 1911, and a group of women working on behalf of themselves and the children and the child laborers who worked there were able to affect change in a power structure, again, in 1911, when it wasn't until 1915 that the first bill made its way to the House of Representatives in order to give women the right to vote. So four years before, and by the way, that, that bill failed in 1915. So four years before the first unsuccessful piece of legislation that would give them the political power that we think we need in order to affect change, a group of women took a tragedy of a shirtwaist factory fire and turned it into better um, and safer working conditions for the people that they cared about. So why do we teach the players of the National Football League um, about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire? Because our mission uh, as a union at times is not only to simply fight uh, and for me to fight anything that comes <laughs> out of Roger's uh, uh, office, which um, I, I do dig um, doing. But, um, I do. Um, but really, our job at times is to take what we know are the facts that we know, combine them with the action that needs to be taken in order to affect and effectuate change. We are awash in information. We know all of these things, but it's not until we convince our men and our leaders to take the information that we know, apply action to it, allow people to take the position from empathy of seeing what the world looks like based on that information, and that's how we effectuate change. So from the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, one last story. Different picture, same knee, different picture. Let me tell you one last story. Um, you know, when I was in school, uh, wasn't a particularly, I just wasn't, a particularly good athlete, did my best, played football, ran track. But my mother and my parents would constantly drill into me the stories of just great players. Paul Robeson was a fantastic idol of mine when I was growing up. Why? Great athlete, yes, he won 15 varsity letters while he was in college playing for four sports. But everybody knows, or everybody should know, that a man like Paul Robeson not only was a great athlete, great scholar, Phi Beta Kappa, went on to, to become a tremendous actor, tremendous singer, ultimately was blackballed by Congress during the McCarthy era because he had the guts to stand out to talk about issues of racial equality. But you know, my parents would drill into me guys like Paul Robeson because it was their only way of getting through a hard-headed kid who only wanted to play sports. Um, Reggie Williams became my Paul Robeson in the 1980s. A uh, guy that went to Dartmouth, not exactly uh, the, the draft ultimate um, uh, in the National Football League, played 14 years for the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, went on to be an executive uh, at Disney. Played for one team as a linebacker. And to me, Reggie Williams was that guy that I wanted to be. Smart, good looking, loved to dress. Wore those hot suits that, you know, were all hot in the 70s. Yes, I had a leisure suit. Um, but you'd see this guy and he was tremendously eloquent. And he played, he was just one of those lunch pail linebackers for the Cincinnati Bengals. 
Well, 14 years after playing for the Bengals, both of Reggie Williams' knees uh, took the beating. They took the beating even as the last two years he was a Bengal. He became a city councilman in the city of Cincinnati. I mean, good gracious. What other kind of football player would you want? What other kind of son would you want? Reggie Williams left, became an NFL executive, went on to become an executive at Disney. I, I hadn't seen Reggie Williams from that TV set until two weeks ago when I happened to be in Sa Sacramento, California to fight a bill that would prevent many of our football players from seeking workers' compensation in the state of California. And when I walked into that room and I saw Reggie Williams, I was a little bit late after flying cross country, walked in, I didn't know he was gonna be there. I saw him sitting in the corner of the room, boom! I mean, even for me, you know, you see guys like Justin and these guys walk in, but when I see a, a guy that I saw, you know, I like to remind him I was just a wee boy when I watched him play. Uh, he got up and almost tore my head off. But um, when I'm sitting there and now you see a man like Reggie Williams who, whose right leg now is four inches shorter than his left leg because of all the surgeries. And then you hear him tell the facts or tell the story that the Cincinnati Bengals didn't give him his workers' comp, that the Cincinnati Bengals aren't doing anything for, for Mike Brown, that even though, I'm sorry, that weren't doing anything for Reggie Williams, that Mike Brown and the Cincinnati Bengals have done nothing for a man who was hurt at work you start to realize that once again, we know all of the facts. We know that football is a business where injuries are sometimes the necessary and foreseeable consequences of their job duties. We know that injuries, torn knees, uh, torn shoulders, concussed heads are things that are going to result from the business duties of the people who work there at work in the same way that the working conditions and the way those people were forced to work in that Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire exposed them to dangers. So now you know why we teach our players about the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. Because it is not until we as a group of people who work for a living make decisions to take the information that we know, apply it to action that we must do, and fight in order to engender change. So on behalf of the National Football League Players Association, I gotta tell you, I dig and love the players I represent. I just do. Um, we will fight for the things that we believe are important for them. We will fight for the things that we need to do in order to make them safe. And each and every day, when you all sit back and think about the draft tonight, um, remember that there's probably kids who are walking across the stage who don't even know that the issues of moral philosophy the issues of what duties flow from an employer to an employee, why we demand that doctors treat our players as patients. I know those things aren't going through those young men's head or they're, as they are walking across that stage, but as we told them last night, sure as heck, your union is thinking about these issues and your union is dedicated and guided by these principles. Thank you. All right, question and answer time. Uh, I'm a big fan of finding out where you're from when, I, when, uh, when you ask a question, so if you don't mind. Uh, right for the starting five. Okay. Um, chat a league as well. Um, Reggie's actually a friend of mine, so it's interesting when, when you brought the first picture up, yeah. I immediately thought about him. You know, he used to live here in Manhattan before he moved down to Orlando, and I went over his house and saw all the therapy he was going through. His leg looks like a fried steak on a grill. You know, he's on his 19th surgery. Yeah. Um, we talked about a lot of the issues uh, regarding the players and stuff like that. Um, how do you address the players? You, you talked about them going uh, across the stage and not thinking about um, their health as much. Yep. You know, what, what do you do to talk to them about these type of uh, – obviously, uh, AstroTurf is gone, you right. know, and that's what – did probably tore up his knee, but how do you talk to the players about those issues? You know, I, I tend to be, and, and for some of the guys, and uh, Justin had to run, and, and probably that's a better question for, for a person like him. Um, when we're in a locker room, when we're in a team meeting, uh, I do have a reputation for being a little blunt with our players. Um, and now you know why I'm that guy who didn't go into the ministry. Uh, but to me, um, it, it is about 
reminding our players that there's no football exception to health and safety. Um, there's no football exception to whether a team complies with OSHA. There's no football exception uh, to whether a doctor has a duty of care uh, and to abide by a Hippocratic Oath when it comes to a player. Um, there's no football exception when it comes to whether or not uh, a, a team has a moral duty to take care of a player who was hurt at work. But all of those things, while they are true, those things do not become real until we as a group of men stand up and demand that those things be acted upon. Now, the, the irony, of course, about Reggie Williams is what? You, you go back uh, to that strike. Um, at the time of the strike, he was a 13 or 14 year veteran who was hoping to play at least one more year. Boomer Esiason at the time had just become the young quarterback for the Cincinnati Bengals and because, again, men like Boomer stand up, became the player rep for that team heading into that strike. Boomer Esiason was concerned about keeping his team together and making sure that none of those players crossed the line. Our friend Reggie Williams did not know the strike. So now, full circle, 30, 40 years later, all of us are together in Sacramento as a unified group of people fighting on behalf of the rights of the whole. So to me, um, those are stories that I tell our players. Um, those are things that, that we um, uh, drill into our players, not because um, you know, I want them to be you know, always wound up and you know, ready to, to start a fight with anybody who comes you know, from the league, although that would be cool. Um, that was a joke. Um, um, I do it because it's not until they understand that the Reggie Williams, and, and whether it's guys like uh, Bill Radovich or guys like Reggie uh, White or former Jet Freeman McNeil, until they realize that those people are them. Um, that they have to take upon themselves this mantle of responsibility and, and, and not see themselves as the individual. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Matt, I'm from SB Nation. Yep. Uh, it, seems, <clears throat> it seems like a common theme for the NFL is to push responsibility down on the teams, whether it's the, uh, the shoddy field at FedEx that led to ACL tears for RG3 right. and Chris Clemens, right. or yesterday's Deadspin story about the Chargers doctor, David Chow. Really? I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, is that a constant battle for the NFLPA Absolutely. to make the NFL responsible and accountable? Uh, accountable, sorry. And, um, and what, are you what are you presently doing to, to, to fight that battle? Sure. Well, you know, look, the, and again, uh, you know, I, I apologize for anyone who is offended by the bluntness of the conversations, but um, the, the National Football League is a cartel when it wants to be, right? Um, where it's, it decides that it's, uh, it's not subject to the antitrust laws or, or things like that. But it, and then it also becomes uh, a loose association of independent, quote unquote, states when it wants to, when they say there's nothing that we can do to force fuel conditions to change on a certain level. Um, what we do as a union uh, is simply to battle all of that. Um, I, I frankly don't care whether uh, they think that they don't have the obligation or the responsibility to make sure that the working conditions are, are safe at a particular um, team. Um, I, I don't really think about it as, as dealing with their perception of things. There are just some universal truths. Um, universal truth, number one, is we happen to live in the United States. Businesses are subject to the Constitution of these United States. Um, when the federal government enacted OSHA uh, to deal with workplace safety issues, uh, my recollection and my firm understanding as just a lawyer who dabbles in labor law is that they didn't craft a football exception to any of that. So um, whether it was when we wrote all of the teams to turn over all of their OSHA data two years ago, or when we meet with the Department of Labor, or when we start to push these issues in front of attorney generals uh, like the one in, in California, um, those are issues to me that are independent uh, of, of what they think about who they are and what they can do. Yes, sir. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Say hello to Matt, Mike. Thank you. Um, Google user. Uh, Damon Jackson, why are you so handsome? I'm kidding. Um, uh, and so tall. Um, uh, what do you enjoy most about this part of the off season? Uh, um, we don't really have an off season. 
um, you know, uh, for us and, and certainly, you know, uh, for, for our families and for the staff of the people who work at the PA, um, we really don't get much of an off season. You know, we go from uh, the end of the season to Pro Bowl to our team meetings to rookie uh, debut that we had last night to rookie premiere in a few years. And then for the folks who travel team to team, we start kicking that off during the off season at OTA. So um, what do I enjoy during the off season? Uh, the, the five hours that I sleep kind of dig. Um, second question, can you explain what the issues arise from HGH testing in the NFL? Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, look, the players of the National Football League want a clean game. But as, uh, as we learned from the bounty issue, uh, and certainly as we most recently learned from the uh, court of independent arbitrators when it comes to HGH, uh, that court told us that WADA's decision limits for HGH were unsound. So for us and for the players of the National Football League, we want a clean game, but we also want a fair process. And until we get a fair process, we're not going to agree to anything. Yes, sir? Uh, just one thing. Um, the NFL just recently made a statement about putting cameras in the locker room. From the, uh, from the Players Association side, what do you see the issues there, privacy issues? How do you yeah. feel about that? I asked uh, Tuck about it, and he just he actually didn't even know. So. Yeah. You know, look, um, again, on balance of things, um, the, the, the league certainly wants to talk about cameras in the locker room. Um, I, I, I dig it a lot more if they put cameras on what our players look like after five years of playing football. Um, my guess is, one, they think generates revenue. One, probably generates empathy. Obviously, probably more interested in the revenue than they are the empathy. Uh, when it comes to things like cameras in the locker room, those are things that we negotiate. Um, I happen to think it's bad uh, for, for the game, and I rarely talk about what's good for the game, but I think it's bad for the game. Yes, sir? Pink, thin, blue. Team player reps. Do you guys? Does your office tell team player reps? Um, do you try to have any influence on telling them to tell the individual players, uh, you know, what kinds of things they can and should or shouldn't do on social media? Um, we do. Uh, we try to give as much guidance as we can. Um, um, generally, we meet. Um, our staff is meeting with the players as a whole, probably about four to five times a year. Uh, we always talk about social media um, on various levels. Um, look, I, I want our men uh, to be good representatives of who they are. Uh, and more often than not, I'm not talking about, you know, game plays and, you know, individual things they want to talk about on Twitter. Um, I talk to them about how you want to be remembered. And think about uh, Twitter as being your autobiography that lasts forever. Um, Ten years, twenty years. 15 years from now, uh, when you have a 17-year-old daughter like I do or a 13-year-old kid like I do, what would you want them to be reading about you? Um, so that's what I do about social media. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. So Dan Marcus, SNY's Jets blog. So um, let me tell you, I appreciated your story, but in a, in a game where the injury rate is 100% and you, as much as the NFL and you guys may try, you can't fundamentally change it. Guys are going to get hurt. It's just going to be the way it happens. What do you mean we can't fund? Let me just take you on just real okay, quick yeah. because we have one minute. Um, uh, uh, two tall gems, um, head slaps, leg whips, horse collars. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's era of, of football, flying wedges and people dying on fields. Um, so let me just sort of push back a little bit. The reality of it is those things went away um, in the game and the game evolved. Um, we've changed the way the game is played. So I, I disagree that when people say you can't change it at all. All right, you know, my, my point is that people are going to get injured regardless. And when right. with such a short playing career, and you really, the, the key to helping your players long term is the fact that you have to set them up financially. Because you can't, I mean, in order to help for their medical bills and things like that after their playing careers. And the way you do that is through collective bargaining. So my question really is, is what would you say to those who say in the last round of collective bargaining that the players lost with the salary cap being lower than it was pre this collective bargaining agreement? And the fact that, you know, the way you set these guys up is by allowing them to, you know, earn more money. And when uh, the cap is lower. Um, I think that we'd respond by, by saying that that's a false, that's just a false postulate. Um, if, um, if you are a guy working at PetSmart working uh, for $5 an hour and you fall off the ladder and break your arm, what happens? 
your employer takes care of you because you got hurt at work. Now, it's not an issue of whether you make $5 an hour or $500 an hour. You have an obligation in the United States of when you get hurt that your employer has an obligation to take care of the injuries that you have. So the issues about the salary cap, um, and we have a deal that is a share of revenue deal. Um, and, and for that, last year we got 55% of all revenue, which is the highest we've ever gotten. But I refuse to believe that because you can put another dollar in a guy's pocket, that that's going to help Reggie Williams, right? Because the reality of it is, why isn't that guy being taken care of by his team when he got hurt at work? And whether he makes back then, I, I can't tell you what that was pre-1993, so uh, pre-CBA, um, I can't tell you how much he made back then. But let's say for the sake of argument that he made $5 million a year, $20 million a year. Who in this room would believe that because he made $20 million a year that he should have to pay for his own surgery? So you don't take care of guys by making sure they get paid more. You take care of guys by making sure that they are financially responsible about the amount of money they make, right? But also if they have injuries at work, that the people who are supposed to take care of them, take care of them. Okay, well if I could, all right, well I got, I got the mic. So if I could piggyback on the fiscal responsibility thing for one second, I would. So how do you, when, when I, read, I read this stat where guys five years out of their playing career, the majority of NFL players don't have a dime left pretty mm -hmm. much. So how do you combat that? Teach, you teach. Um, you teach and you do things like, like do we start to create mandatory savings programs for players? Mm -hmm. But look, at the end of the day, um, if you have a young man who has a checking account um, or a debit card before he has a savings account, he probably doesn't understand what it means to save. If you have a person who hasn't been taught uh, the importance of saving his money and pushing it out beyond the 16 game checks that he gets, I don't care how much um, you do, that's a person who needs to understand how to budget. So there are no prophylactics. There is nothing that we are going to do magically where I'm going to say something to a young man, say something to you in an hour that's going to change your behavior. What does matter is if you take upon yourself the responsibility that you have to yourself and your family as a provider and know that you probably have a three and a half year career and that to use football and springboard it, you need to springboard to something else uh, that's going to change your life. Hey, look, that's the way you teach. And that's the way you hopefully instill issues of personal responsibility. That's what we do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the players, thank you very much. Thanks for coming.